Good morning and thank you for joining with us in worship on this the third Sunday in Lent. Sometimes when we come to worship, our hearts are downcast and our spirits can be low. And we're not alone when we feel this way. On many occasions in scripture, we hear people cry out to God. And in this season of Lent, as we recall Jesus' journey through the wilderness, and perhaps times in our own lives when we feel that we have walked a similar path, it gives us the permission to be truthful and honest before God. So as we enter this time of worship this morning, hear the words of Jesus recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. I'm reading from the message paraphrase this morning. It says this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let us pray. God, you rejoice with those who rejoice. You mourn with those who mourn. And you call us to do the same. As we join together as your church this morning, we acknowledge that some are feeling tired, worn out, and possibly even burned out. Help us, Lord, as we worship this morning to learn from you, your unforced rhythms of grace. Help us to trust that you will not lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on us, and to trust through you that we can learn to live freely and lightly. Meet us, Lord, where we are at this morning. Help us to be honest with you today. And may this time of worship revive and equip us, Lord, we pray. Amen. We sing together that wonderful hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Accessible hid from our eyes 
As we come to God again in prayer, we do so in repentance of sins that we have committed, both knowingly and unknowingly. We all make mistakes. We all do things that we regret, often driven by subconscious motives that we're barely even aware of. But the good news is that there is a way forward, a way to let go of the guilt and to put it behind us. Owning our sins and asking for forgiveness is the most life-giving thing we can do. It is critical for our physical, our mental and our spiritual well-being. We have a forgiving God, so we come before him in prayer. Let us pray. God of compassion, thank you that you see all things, know all things and have mercy beyond our deserving. We're sorry for the ways in which we have hurt others, for our failures to love you as you would love, and for our dishonesty in both big and small things, and our sometimes deliberate sins. In your compassion and mercy, forgive us, and by your grace, help us to begin again. Lord, restore in us a pure heart, a right relationship with you and the joy of walking in your ways. Amen. We continue to worship as we sing prayerfully together, Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Show your 
will be clean for all the world to see. Our Old Testament reading is found this morning in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, and will be read for us by David. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals. For you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. And I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. I said a few weeks ago that we wanted to include a few more children friendly worship songs or hymns into our services. Today we're going to sing a newish one by Wren Collective called My Lighthouse. But no matter what age we are, the words of this song are really relevant to us, especially in our wilderness journey. If you know it, I'd encourage you to sing along, and if not, you should catch on to it quite quickly. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. The peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me 
Testament reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 20 to 29, and then 32 to 36. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, The teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. Some of the best films set in the wilderness are stories of personal tragedy. The Way pays tribute to the power of the popular long distance walk, the Camino de Santiago. It tells the story of a father who goes overseas to recover the body of his estranged son. His son had died in a storm while traveling the El Camino de Santiago. And the father then decides to take the, the pilgrimage for himself. It is a sad and poignant film, which ultimately becomes uplifting and inspirational. Or there's the film Wild, which again is sparked by personal tragedy and troubles and tells the story of a woman's 1,100 mile soul hike across the Pacific Crest Trail in America. Or perhaps you have read the book or watched the film 127 Hours, another true story about a climber who ends up trapped under a boulder while canyoneering alone in Utah. Over five days, he examines his life and considers his options, which lead him to an agonizing and excruciating choice to amputate his own arm so that he can free himself and try to get back to civilization. The wilderness is a harsh and a difficult place, whether we are there physically or spiritually. It is a place that has the power to transform us to make us stronger. But without doubt, while we are walking that desert, that wilderness journey, it is a place of sorrow and lament. Over the past two weeks, we have reflected on how the Holy Spirit can call us into the wilderness, that we might be transformed. We have looked at how worship in the wilderness looks different than worship on the mountaintop and often includes solitude and simplicity. But this week, we come to the stark truth that wilderness worship often involves sorrow. Many of us will not have experienced a physical desert or wilderness. We may have a romanticized ideal of what living out in the wilderness might look like. But in the Bible, there was no such misapprehension. Not only were deserts lacking in food and water, but there were places of danger. As Tom Wright explains when he says, the wilderness became a haunt for wild animals. The desert offered criminals a place to hide and plan, and open spaces between towns and cities were lawless. Dangerous places from which travelers would be eager to escape by scurrying into the next built up area. For all these reasons, the wilderness was feared. 
for people in Bible times, it represented the unknown, danger, failure, and mortality. Scripture often depicts the experience of God's presence or blessing with the imagery of water. We read of streams, oases and rivers. In comparison, it describes times of distress, doubt and loneliness from God with the imagery of wilderness or desert. The wilderness is where water is scarce where the traveller walks alone in the heat of the day and the cold of the night without shade or protection, and where animals, wild animals, live and take their prey. Today, we are not good at talking about or reflecting on these kinds of issues. Issues that we all struggle with, fear, doubt, disappointment, anger, hurt, all of us, will at some point be faced with the mortality of ourselves or a loved one. And yet so often we brush these thoughts under the carpet. We're more prone to keep the stiff upper lip, to keep calm and carry on. Even with God, we can come into church or to a prayer meeting and try to pretend that everything is okay. Would God really want to hear about my struggles? Can I be honest with a holy God? I want to encourage us this morning by reassuring you that God hears our cries of distress. God may at many times in our lives feel far away, distant, absent, unresponsive. Our faith may feel doubtful or uncertain and we feel alone, vulnerable, lost and unprotected. I'm sure this is how the children of Israel must have felt when they were enslaved in Egypt. But in our reading from Exodus, we heard these reassuring words spoken by God to Moses. I have heard their cries of distress. I am aware of their suffering. God may feel far away, but the truth is he has not disappeared. He is still God all-powerful, all-knowing, loving you and loving me with unconditional love. And he hears the cries of your distress and he is aware of your suffering. He knows all about it, your health issues, those family problems that you're trying to navigate, your doubts and fears, your financial worries, your grief and your pain. Everything you experience, not only in the good times, but in those wilderness days, God knows about it. God hears your cry and more than that, when the time is right, he'll intercede. Verse eight tells us in that passage in Exodus, so I have come down to rescue them. We have already learned in previous weeks that our wilderness journey can be one of testing and transformation, but it will come to an end. You can't live forever in the wilderness and God doesn't want you to. He hears your distress. He is aware of your suffering. He will rescue you. Our God is not blind to our struggles or deaf to our cries. He does not consider it a lack of faith, an insult or a sin if we choose to be honest with him. We can tell him about our doubts how we feel about the state of the world, or even share how we feel disappointed with him and with others. In fact, he wants his people to cry out to him in honesty and desperation. The Psalms are full of honest, raw complaint, sorrow and protest. Bible characters throughout scripture pray heartfelt prayers of distress. These prayers are called lament. The songwriter Michael Card describes the importance of the wilderness in teaching us to lament when he writes these words. You and I were created to wake up in a garden. Instead, we open our eyes each morning to a fallen wilderness, a world where our omnipresent God seems disturbingly absent. God transforms us and leads us by his grace into a pathway back to his presence. This path is found in the language of lament, 
when we lack the language to articulate this forsaken, fallen struggle, when we long for the words to cry out our confusion and bewilderment, the Bible provides such a language for us. Lament is learned only in the wilderness. Of the 150 psalms recorded for us in scripture, over 40 of them are psalms of lament, where we read words such as, Wake up, O Lord, why do you sleep? Why do you look the other way? Or in Psalm 74, we read, O oh God, why have you rejected us so long? And, and just a few Psalms over in 79, we read, O oh Lord, how long will you be angry with us? Forever. And again in Psalm 90, O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Do your prayers ever sound like this? I know that some people might feel it wrong to speak to a holy God in such a way, but scripture helps us to be honest with our feelings, to cry out in honesty before God, to ask those difficult questions, to be truthful about our wilderness journey. And the truth is God does hear us and he does see us and he does respond. The problem for us is that it's not always in our timing or in the way in which we would like. This brings us to the second point this morning, where we want to think that Jesus meets us in his sovereign timing. We only need to look a bit closer at our New Testament reading to see this. We heard the account of Jesus coming to Bethany on the beckoning of some of his close friends. Verse 3 of chapter 11 of John's Gospel tells us, So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now, if you or I got that message, we'd probably leave everything and go immediately to our friend's house, or at least pre-COVID we would have. But verse 5 tells us, So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Can you imagine what that must have been like for Mary, Mary and Martha? They had reached out in faith and friendship to Jesus, who they knew could heal the sick. Yet he didn't come straight away. His timing, his purpose was different to theirs. It had to be. He is the eternal sovereign God and they, like us, are only humans. His viewpoint is heavenly, eternal. Theirs, like ours, are short-sighted and earthly. But by the time Jesus answers their cries to help their brother, Lazarus is dead. And so we see two very different responses to Jesus. Verse 20 tells us, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha goes out to meet Jesus and confronts him. Mary stays at home surrounded by people consoling her in her grief. And the conversation these two sisters have with Jesus are different. When Martha's brother dies, she goes to Jesus with a theological question. And Jesus meets her in that. He listens. He responds with a deep truth that she can place her hope in. We read Martha's conversation with Jesus in verses 21 to 25 of John 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Mary, on the other hand, is completely different. She has a question, but she mostly weeps. And so Jesus is moved so deeply in his spirit that he weeps with her. Even though Jesus must know what he is about to do, he is profoundly sorrowful for Lazarus and he's not afraid to show it. 
We read in verses 33 to 35. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The story of Exodus and of Moses demonstrates another of God's reactions to sorrowful circumstances. Moses isn't mourning a death. His issue is the mistreatment of his people under the Egyptians. But he's consumed with self-doubt at the mistake he already made in trying to sort out that situation when he killed an Egyptian. And God comes to Moses to tell him that he cares, he heals, and that he is calling Moses to do something about it now. In God's sovereign timing, many years after Moses himself had fled Egypt. So if you are like Martha, wilderness worship is a place for you to be honest with God, to tell him how you feel, to ask him difficult questions, to call out like the psalmist, how long Lord? All these things are okay with him and he will meet you in your honesty. Wilderness worship is also a place to weep, to just let it all out like Mary did. That's okay with God too. Jesus stands and weeps with you. Or maybe you're more like Moses where in wilderness worship God wants to show you his heart for a situation. God may move you for an injustice, a need or a person. It may be that he impresses his sorrow for something in your heart and then he sends you to go and do something about it in his power. Whoever you can relate more to this morning, Mary, Martha or Moses, know with assurance that you are not alone in the wilderness. God hears the cries of your distress. God is aware of your suffering and in the right time, he will meet you with his sovereign grace. Amen. We are going to use some of the Psalms of lament as we bring our prayers for others to God this morning. I would ask that you would say aloud the words on the screen after which I will say a short prayer. Let us pray. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Lord, this morning we pray for those who feel forgotten and unseen. May they know that they are remembered and seen by you. Help us to partner with you to remember the forgotten. Search our hearts to reveal those we hide our faces from. The outcast, the stranger, the homeless. Change our hearts that we may turn our faces towards these people and see them created in your image as your beloved children. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? We pray, Lord, for those we know who struggle with mental illness, anxiety and depression. We pray that there will be resources released to help, enough staff employed and finances given towards mental health services here in Northern Ireland, especially post lockdown. Help us to be a friend and a listening ear to those who are suffering. Fill us Lord with your compassion and wisdom. Ultimately, we pray for those who wrestle with sorrow that they may know your victory over those dark thoughts which currently seem to triumph. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. 
Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Lord, we pray for those who might be considered fallen by those around them. May they know your restoration and grace. Help us to not judge or exclude your beloved children, but instead lift them up in prayer and embrace them with the grace we know in Christ. Thank you, loving Father, for hearing our prayers. And so we exclaim together, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises for he has been good to me. Amen. We conclude our service this morning declaring the sovereignty of God as we sing together, Sovereign Over Us. There is strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting You're sanctifying us When beyond our understanding You're teaching us to trust Oh, your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood You're faithful forever Perfect in love You are sovereign over us You are with Unimagined Who could understand your ways Reigning high above the heavens Reaching down in endless grace You're the lifter of the lowly Passionate and kind You surround and you uphold me And your promises are my delight Oh, your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood you're faithful forever, perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. Oh, your plans are still to prosper, you have not forgotten us, you're with us in the fire and the flood. You're
that before God, all hearts are open and no secrets are hidden. So may we continue to talk openly with God as we go from this time of worship. And as we do, may we be people who listen to others, sharing their sorrows and spreading God's comfort and peace. And may that peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on us now and forevermore. Amen.